Hey guys, and welcome to Jeep Sheep TV. This is part three of the do-it-yourself budget under a thousand dollars supercharger project. This part three is where we're going to be talking about the intake piping, which is probably one of the major secrets to keeping this as a budget build. All right, you got to hear this. Do it. <laughs> the first thing that we are going to talk about is the piping that I chose. So I mentioned this in the introduction video. We are using PVC piping for this project. And I know what you're thinking right off the bat. Why are you using PVC or better yet? Can you use PVC? The answer is yes, you can use PVC, but I will share with you the pros and cons of doing so. So you know what you're getting into if you're going to do this with me. The pros. It is low cost. I'll be breaking down that in just a moment, how we saved a lot of money by using PVC. You can bend it with heat. Bending it with heat is really great because we can make our own custom bends with tools that you have in your house already. And it will work. The PVC pipe can definitely hold up to the pressures and for the most part, the temperatures that it's going to be seeing. And yeah, you can connect it to things and you can run air through it. So it should definitely work. The cons, this is the stuff you need to be watching out for. We're going to be talking about how to bend the PVC pipe, which takes heat. So if it gets soft and malleable with heat, it could do it again. And you want to make sure that your piping is kept nice and cool in your engine bay, which is generally known for being a hot place. The other one is cold. So this is something that I haven't experienced yet because I haven't driven the Jeep all winter long. It has been summer months since I've done the modification and in the cold weather, it's possible that PVC could become brittle. And we can talk about that in future videos if that problem arises. The last thing, and this is definitely a pro to the PVC is you can use your custom made bends as templates to order or have a shop fabricate you a, a more metal solution, something that's a little bit more permanent and would be better suited for higher boost applications. Our boost levels are so incredibly low that the PVC is probably going to work just fine. But if you have any concerns or you want to solidify this or make it just look better, you can use your PVC as a template and all of your trial and error can be done on something that's for really, really low cost. The next thing we are going to talk about is the routing. So this is kind of exciting because this part is really where we're into the wild west of this project. There is no kit out there showing how to do this. There is no, you know, instruction manual except for this one. And so what I had to do was I had to create a pipe routing scheme of my own. And that's what I'm going to share with you. I'm also going to share with you an alternate pipe routing scheme because I there's a few things I don't like about mine and we're all going to learn together. So this one right here, this is how I did it. Now you'll see that the drawing is fairly rudimentary. The supercharger is here. This is your engine, this rectangle, that U shaped piece. That is your intake manifold and your inner inner cooler is down here. I have also added arrows. So you'll see this little arrow down here. One arrow is low pressure or atmospheric pressure. And so here he is. And two arrows is compressed air or air that's been blown and happens to be of a higher pressure. Remember, we talked about that. Now the black here, this is where the PVC piping is happening. And the ones, twos, threes, and fours are the different types of connectors or couplings that we used. And we're going to be talking about that all down here in just a moment. So with this method, we are taking advantage of the intended design of the supercharger. This is really important. You might be watching this thinking there's definitely an easier way I could have done this and you would be right. However, what I ended up doing is grabbing a project that is relatively difficult to begin with and making it even more difficult by trying to install a supercharger with a clutched pulley. So one of the requirements to this project that I wanted was to be able to turn the supercharger on and off. If I'm in a situation where I've done something wrong in the system, I'd like to be able to turn it off so that I can prevent any damage to the engine or continue down the road. I do like to take some longer trips. As we are driving this supercharged 2.5 liter four cylinder YJ across the country, it's been living in Arizona for a couple months and we're taking a road trip from here back to Michigan. 
So a clutch supercharger was important for that, but there's a lot of challenges that came with a clutch supercharger. One being there needs to be a bypass circuit that allows for air to pass through the entire system to get into your engine when the clutch is off. If you're running a supercharger without a clutch, and I know some of you have mentioned you're going to try the M45 challenge, which is to use the smaller supercharger off the later model Mercedes, and I think that's great. If you're doing something like that and you don't have a clutch, life's going to be a little bit easier. You've probably noticed that your supercharger has a built-in bypass circuitry and it's going to eliminate a lot of this for you. So that will be a lot easier. Like I said in the previous videos, I don't know how well it fits, but I'm really excited to hear your feedback and I want some pictures. So please send me pictures. Quick side note, if you don't know how to send me pictures, Jeep Sheep TV at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram jeep.sheep or on Facebook Jeep Sheep TV. Make sure to look at those different pages because sometimes you get some sneak previews into future videos and that's a great way to contact me and send me pictures or ask me questions. And uh, the other side note, and I apologize that we're getting off track here, the community tab on the YouTube page. Go to my channel page, go over to the tab that says community and there's a post on there, all caps supercharger post. That is where you can go and ask questions. There is a growing community of us that are going to be doing this, which is both exciting, humbling, and terrifying. Good luck to all of you, and I hope that this is helpful. Okay, coming on back to this. So the Mercedes, how they had it set up was they had an intake port over here, and the compressed part, or the boosted part, or whatever, the outlet, had a small port that came off the side and another one that came down. The one that goes down is to go to the intercooler. They had an intercooler in their setup. And the one that came off to the side went to a butterfly valve and then to the air box. So that is exactly what we did. We emulated a proven design, something that is already on the road, of course, by Mercedes. So what I have here is the supercharger and I have a pipe that is coming out going to a butterfly valve, which we are going to talk about quite a bit in just a moment. And then that is going to go to a Y pipe. The Y pipe also goes to the inlet. And both of those are going to some kind of air filter. So your air is going to come in here. If the valve is closed, it's going to go through the supercharger. And then on the outlet of the supercharger is here. It'll go through the intercooler. And you've got your higher pressure air will go into your intake manifold. If that valve is open, the supercharger is probably off because I'm assuming that's what you programmed it to do is to open this up when the supercharger is off and the air will then go this way through the intercooler and back up. There are some definite cons to this system. The one con being that when the supercharger is off, you're running through, and I mentioned this is a smaller diameter pipe, so you're running through a smaller diameter pipe, lots of losses, then you're going through an intercooler, again, Cold air is good, but the intercooler is going to have a lot of losses in it that your little four cylinder is not going to be happy about, and then it'll go in. So you will see some definite horsepower losses when you're running in naturally aspirated mode. However, as I've obviously said in this video, you do see some definite horsepower gains running in supercharged mode. So this system is what I have in my Jeep currently. It does work. It definitely works. This system over here is the one that I want to try next. This is the one that I will probably be doing, and I'm sure there will be videos about this version when I've completed this one. This is a little bit different. So we're going to block off right here. We're going to block off the bypass port on the supercharger. We might cut it, cap it. However, we'll figure it out when we get there. By doing that, now the, we don't have any naturally aspirated air running through the supercharger system. What we have is we have a little box that we need to create, and this is why I didn't do this. I was on a time crunch, I was getting uh, the Jeep out to Moab, and the supercharger project needed to be finished. So I only had time for things that had minimal amounts of fabricating, and this box would have been more fabricating than I had time for, unfortunately. So what you'd have is a box that has two different ports. One normal inlet port and another one which has a butterfly valve attached to it. This way, if and that's that little dot, that's the butterfly valve. 
I apologize, it's not very obvious. But this way, if the valve is open, air is gonna come in the air cleaner, make a right hand turn and go straight down into your intake manifold. If the valve is closed and notice there is far less piping for the valve being closed. If the valve is closed, this box is now sealed, supercharger is on, air will come in, it'll go through the supercharger, intercooler, and back in. This way, your naturally aspirated air has a short path to go through versus having to pass through an intercooler, which robs quite a bit of horsepower. Take a mental note, take a screenshot if you have to, if you're doing this project and you want to do this one first, beat me to it, show me why it's good or why it's not then uh, there's your diagram. The first challenging part of every project is finding all of the parts. I struggle with this a lot, getting all of the right pieces and parts, and that was a definite challenge on this project, as, again, there is no kit for this or instruction manual. This is your throttle body right here. This is what goes into your Jeep. That is a two and a half inch diameter throttle body. Your supercharger also has two and a half inches for the inlet port, but the bypass is one and a half inches and the outlet is two inches. And it's actually not exact, these are all metric, but it's this is the closest equivalent. I found the Mini Cooper intercooler, previous video, to have two inch ports. I specifically spec'd it out to get an intercooler with two inch ports to match the outlet of the supercharger. Your losses, your greatest losses are going to be your smallest diameter. So to say, oh, I'm gonna run two and a half inch pipe everywhere, it, that'd be nice, but you're still at your smallest hole here. Now, with that being said, a two and a half inch pipe is probably going to experience fewer losses than a two inch pipe, but I believe I mentioned this in a previous video, and here's the question, why am I using two inch pipe? The reason being, I couldn't find two and a half inch pipe at the local hardware store. There was none to be found. I did an internet search and they're very, very rare, far between, and the price is not low because it's kind of a specialty size of pipe. So we went with two inch pipe because another criteria to this build, other than it being cheap, other than the supercharger being able to be de deactivated, is all of the parts need to be relatively easily sourced. So you can do it just about anywhere that you are if you can find the supercharger. And if you have to make a repair, you can do so with fairly simple parts. So we chose two inch PVC pipe for this project. Now, we've got a bunch of different diameters here and I'm going to explain how we managed all of these different diameters. So we're gonna walk over to our parts list here and I have the approximate cost because this is important. The price of the PVC pipe and all of the couplings came out to be about $60 if you account for scrap. You can get a $100 kit on eBay for a turbo kit and maybe you'll have enough bends and elbows to make it work, but it's definitely not going to be as form fitting as if you build it yourself. Additionally, if you can't get all the components with the eBay kit, you can find some of these 90 degree fittings, the, the, like the silicone fittings, um, even just the straight ones are 12, 15 bucks. And the fittings that, and I, I'm sorry, not fittings, couplings. The couplings that we're using are at most $7 and $8 for the 90 degree rubber boot. So the prices are definitely a lot cheaper and the advantage to this is that you can find it in your local hardware store. But there are some disadvantages to these as well, which we're gonna talk about towards the end of the video. I've got some numbers over here. These numbers are gonna to correspond to our picture, and this is how this is going to work. So you're going to buy two inch diameter PVC pipe, and you're gonna buy roughly 10 feet of it. That's roughly what you need. And then we have these Fernco couplings, that's what I'm calling them. They look like this. It is a rubber coupling with a metal shell on it, I selected these because I figured in areas that have high pressure, the metal shell is going to keep the rubber from popping. The downfall to these is in vibration. They don't have a lot of flex. And so areas where you're trying to account for multiple different diameters 
or lots of vibration, these are not going to be super great. These are the rubber couplings, and normally it has two hose clamps on it. These are a little bit thicker, and they're a lot more flexible, and they're quite a bit larger. They're actually also made by Fernco, but I'm calling this the Fernco coupling, and this one just the rubber coupling. So these are areas of high vibration, but lower pressure if you can afford it. The 90 degree rubber boot, I'll show you a picture of that because it's currently installed on the Jeep and a two inch to one and a half inch coupling. So if we're gonna walk around the image, the Fernco or the metal encased couplings are going to be here, which is the outlet of the supercharger. That makes sense, that's a high pressure area. Over here, going to the bypass valve. Number four, is the two inch to one and a half inch Franco coupling. So that one's gonna have a metal boot around it as well. And that's right here between the supercharger and the piping to the bypass valve. The rubber couplings, the, the thicker ones, are gonna be on the intercooler. You're gonna want something that can handle vibration because this is separate from the engine over here and here. And then you're also gonna have it here going to your inlet port. And then number three, like I said, is the rubber boot and that is a 90 degree boot going from your piping to your intake manifold or your throttle body. Now your throttle body is two and a half inches and the piping going to it is two inches. So you're gonna buy a two inch boot and you'll just warm it up a little bit or just gently massage it and you can definitely stretch it onto the two and a half inch. And that's how we're gonna accommodate for these different sizes is some of the more flexible rubber ones we can flex. So we have a two and a half inch here at the inlet to the supercharger, but you have a two inch pipe going to it. So you'll buy a two inch rubber coupling and you will stretch it. You can add a little bit of heat and stretch it and you can get it over that piece there. Areas like the outlet are relatively fixed and you can use the two inch Fern Co. coupling, which is a lot less flexible, and you want that to be a two inch to two inch area. And the bypass valve here is also, it doesn't need a lot of flexibility. So you can use that Fern Co. coupling there. The other thing to note is areas of high pressure. Anytime that you're making a sharp bend or you're just before an intercooler, which has a lot of losses, you're going to see a lot of pressure. So Having the Fernco coupling here is pretty important. It's a high pressure area. Down here, if we could have used one, we would have, but we didn't. So what actually happened there is I did blow up one of these. No. And you can see that it's all split. You wanna make sure that your piping is nice and straight going to the intercooler. You don't want there to be an area for air to build up and create pressure points on your couplings. Another thing that I did here is I just added more hose clamps to kind of help keep this together on the one that's installed in the Jeep now. This is an area where I would say it's totally okay to spend the extra money and to get one of the reinforced silicone couplings because this area here and even where this one is, those areas are really, uh, that is the highest pressure of the entire system. The other thing that you'll notice is that these come with standard hose clamps as part of the package. All of them do. That's another great cost save because in most situations you'll use this, which is a bolt clamp. Bolt clamps are also really expensive and you're going to need a lot of them. So it's important to know where you need them and where you don't need them. I was able to complete this project with nothing but hose clamps, but I do recommend using bolt clamps in a few areas. Those areas are going to be right here before the intercooler, here going from the supercharger to the piping to the intercooler, and definitely in here, the piping going to the bypass valve. This generates a lot of pressure and you're going to want to put bolt clamps in here as needed. I would recommend starting with hose clamps as they're a lot cheaper. And when you blow a pipe off, you convert over to a bolt clamp. Another area, could be here from the intercooler to the piping going to the intake manifold, but I haven't had a lot of issues with that area, so I would definitely start with the hose clamp. Okay, the next thing that we need to talk about is the bypass valve. Here's a little illustration of the bypass valve. 
This is a valve that you can find on Amazon. It's actually for exhaust cutouts. So if you want your exhaust to be really loud, you'd install one of these. They're vacuum actuated, so they're relatively simple and they're relatively inexpensive. It was one of the higher price items of the build and it's 30 to $50 depending on the one that you get. This is gonna be your crash course into the bypass valve. So really quick, let's talk about what we have here. Bypass valve has a diaphragm on it, which is represented right here. This is the throttle plate. There is a vacuum line, which goes to a vacuum switch. It is off of a Buick. The vacuum switch has three ports. There's one that has a foam piece on it. This is for venting to atmosphere. This one here is going to go to your device, and this one is going to go to your engine through a check valve. So starting with the check valve, the check valve is allowing the air to only go one way, which is towards the engine. It should say vacuum or this way, have an arrow, and that wants to go towards the engine because the engine is going to draw a vacuum. It's going to suck in air. When the supercharger's on, it is going to be a positive pressure rather than negative, and you don't want air coming back through here because it'll screw you all up. Now back to the vacuum switch, it has an on and off. When it is off, so when you're not sending 12 volts to it, and it is a 12 volt switch, when it's off, it looks something like this. So your engine, so the arrow is going towards the engine. The engine is going to be pulling vacuum through this other nipple here, which goes to your device. When it is switched on, that means you're sending 12 volts to it through your controller. It's going to connect this uh, device side nipple to the blow off area. And what that's going to do is I, you see the arrows, they're going backwards of what you would expect. The reason is, is when this diaphragm is sucked down, it's gonna wanna hold that position. And then once you've removed the vacuum, that needs to go somewhere. And so it's going to open back up. This is spring loaded. And so it's gonna wanna open back up and needs to suck air in. It's gonna suck air in through this. The foam is a filter because you don't wanna be sucking in any kind of dirty air. It will eventually end up in your engine. So with that being said, since when this is off, it's pulling vacuum. And when it is on, it's allowing it to vent. You need to have a normally closed bypass valve. It's important. There's normally open, there's normally closed. Normally closed means that this throttle plate is closed when nothing's happening, when no vacuum is present. And it is open when vacuum is present. When your Jeep is running in naturally aspirated mode, it is creating a vacuum. And so you're going to want to utilize that vacuum to actuate this throttle valve, opening it up. When the supercharger is running, normally you would think, oh great, the supercharger is building positive pressure, it's going to reduce that vacuum, and we don't even need this switch, it should be able to close it. Kind of true, kind of not. It's going to have a hard time building that pressure with this open, and therefore you're going to want this switch to do the work for you so that way the supercharger is not actuating its own valve. That's a feedback loop that doesn't necessarily work. So what they did on the Buicks over at General Motors is they figured out they needed one of these to vent the, uh, the negative pressure in here, allow that to fill back up so that way it can actuate. So this little guy here, it is steel. It is vacuum actuated and it's actually not my favorite. It's something, it's the one thing that I would have done different in the entire build. But I'm gonna explain to you how I did this piece in case you want to emulate because the alternative is an electronic throttle body and it's going to involve a little bit of programming and a little bit of pulse width modulation, which sounds scary, it really is not. We're definitely gonna be going that way to the electronic throttle body. However, you can make it work and this is how you would do so. If you take the bypass valve and you grind little chamfers around the edge of it, you can weld something to it. The chamfers are just for the weld to fill in. It gives the weld a place to go and it's gonna give you a stronger system. What we found is that you can buy exhaust pipe couplings at your local auto parts store. These are just little guys for attaching pieces of exhaust pipe and they come in various diameters. Your PVC pipe, although it says two inches, it's talking about the inner diameter of the PVC pipe. The outer diameter is actually two and a quarter. And so if you were to have a coupling go from this to something else, you would want that to also be two and a quarter. And you can buy a two and a quarter diameter pipe coupling from the auto parts store. And what you'll do is you're going to cut it and use the two halves and you can weld those two halves to each end of your bypass valve. I mentioned this in previous episodes. Yes, we did some welding. Yes, welders are expensive and it is a skill. However, 
Neither of us were very skilled at welding, and we used the cheapest welder on Amazon. I will put a link to that below if you want to buy one. I also, like I said in the previous video, just bought a welder called Yes Welder, and I'm really happy with it. It's a little bit more money, but it's a lot cheaper than some of the major name brands, and it does do a very good job. So I'll have a link to that as well, and you can go and check out the Yes Welder. Okay, we're gonna make sure that we add that Y pipe for two inch PVC. I don't remember what the cost on this one was, but it's probably in the five to nine dollar range. This right here is a Y pipe. It's just a PVC Y pipe for a two inch PVC that you can buy at any hardware store. That Y pipe is going to connect to your bypass valve. You can just shove it in there. That two and a quarter inches will fit right into the Y pipe because the Y pipe is designed to go over the two and a quarter inch outer diameter of a two inch PVC pipe. And so you can just shove that right in there. This area right here is a very low pressure area. In fact, there's no pressure because the bypass valve when closed is preventing air from getting through. And when open, air is flowing this way and it's naturally aspirated mode. So there's no pressure there. You can just shove it in and call it a day. The other end of the Y pipe is going to fit over top of PVC. And I did try to do a PVC weld on this, which is you know a chemical dealio, and it didn't work so well. It held as you would expect, but with all the vibrations, the moving around and the heat and everything inside of the engine bay of a Jeep, it would like to separate. So I did drive a couple small screws. I just chose some sheet metal screws through the Y pipe into the PVC and it holds very nice and strong your air cleaner for this this is up to you i believe i really do believe that you can use your factory air box for this modification what i ran into is i started running out of space very quickly i still think it can be done but i opted for a cold air intake this one was produced by aem of course there's links for all of these things down below um, AEM, theirs is, it's like a K&N filter, but it doesn't have oil. And so you don't need to oil it, which is nice. I don't like a lot of maintenance and it's made for a two and a half inch intake bore port, whatever. And if you heat it up just a little bit, you can stretch it right over top of the end of that Y pipe. And it sits on there really tight because you had to stretch it. So that was a very nice fit and surprisingly easy. You ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> the next thing that we're going to talk about is the PVC pipe. Now the exciting part and the fun part of this build is going to be bending your own PVC pipe and making your own custom tubing. So if you don't already know, PVC pipe has a melting temperature. It's plastic. And so it gets all gooey, just like most plastics do. And that happens somewhere in the ballpark of 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So you heat this up to 250 degrees and you can move it around by hand, which is really quite fun. The first step is to measure. You can take a, like a rubber hose would be good for this, or really anything flexible that sort of keeps its shape and make the shape that you want and then measure the length of that. Then you'll cut your PVC pipe to just a little bit larger than that. And actually a good template is the width of the cap. Say that because the caps are gonna be on there. The PVC pipe, you'll notice it didn't bend much here. It's not gonna want to bend much here. And so take the width of the cap maybe a little bit more and say that that's gonna be your excess. And then when it's all said and done and it's bent to shape, that's what you're gonna cut off. Hey Brad, where's the air go? Nice. There's two methods to doing this. Both of them involve your oven. So for method one and method one, I would say it's really good for the longer bends. So we're talking about this big guy here going from the intercooler to the intake and from the air cleaner to the intake of the supercharger. Those are really good candidates for method one. And also this little piece right here going to your bypass valve will also work for method one or two. Method one is the sand method. So I naturally, like anyone else, I looked online, can you bend PVC pipe and found a YouTube video, which is basically what you're doing now, 
except you were searching for superchargers and Jeeps, I assume, and you found a YouTube video. And in the YouTube video, what they did is they heated up sand to 450 degrees. I'm going with a lower rack because uh, I figure it'll heat up a little faster. I don't really know. I don't cook much. But when I do, I cook sand. About 45 minutes, you should have a cake. And you pour the hot 450 degree sand into the pipe. You have the ends capped. That's really important, by the way. Don't spill the sand everywhere. It's terrifying. And you can just use normal PVC caps and you actually don't even need to glue them in or anything like that. Just make sure they don't fall off because again, it's terrifying. Put your cap on one end. You definitely need a friend for this. Get yourself some welding gloves if you have them. Hopefully you do because there's welding involved in this project or oven mitts. Make sure you're wearing pants and closed toed shoes because pouring 400 degree sand on yourself is not fun. And you'll have someone hold the pipe and then make yourself a funnel. You can do a cardboard funnel. That works just fine. Have your friend or yourself pour the 450 degree sand into the PVC pipe. Once it's in there, cap off the top. Now you've got a piece of pipe that is capped on both ends and it has 450 degree sand on the inside. It'll take a few minutes before that heat makes it out into the PVC pipe. And then the pipe is going to just become like putty. The reason why you're using sand for this is when you bend it, the sand is going to keep the pipe from collapsing. You really do not want kinks in your pipe because each kink is a fluid flow loss as air is passing through this and it hits the kinks and it's got to go all over the place that is going to create losses in fluid flow. And so your pipe is full of sand and you're going to want to just gently bend it to make some of these larger bends. Okay, there you go. That's how she rolls. Now you hold it here for about 45 minutes while it cools. You either have to hold it in place until it cools off, which could be a while, or you need to make some kind of apparatus that holds it in place. Stick wood under it, zip tie it to things, you know, wrap some wire around it, I don't care. Get it so that way it stays in place. Once it's all done, you can clean it out, and we're talking really clean it out. Every bit of sand that's in there is going to end up in your engine, right? And then you're going to have some excess that you then cut off. Once you've cut off the excess, you can start kind of fitting it into place. What will likely happen at this point is your ends are not going to be very round anymore because as you're squeezing it and bending it and moving it, you probably made them a little bit more of an oval and less of a circle. So while you're at the auto parts store, you can pick up one of these. This is a reducer of some kind. I will put a link down below and then you'll know exactly what diameter I used. But really all this does is it has one diameter and then it has another diameter. And I believe this one's two inches because it fits in my two inch pipe. So you can use this and shove it in and use it to make the pipe round again. Now, once everything's round, you can go ahead and test fit it and you'll put your couplings on. And you'll attach your couplings to the other components and then you'll probably decide that a few things need to be tweaked. I would recommend getting a heat gun for this process and what you'll do then is you're gonna slowly heat the areas that need tweaked. So just really, really slow. You see these burn marks here? You don't wanna do that. That's from overheating. The next thing you're going to want to do, heat up just the edge of this. And you're going to take the reducer and you're going to smack it in there real good. And you want just this edge to be larger than the rest of the pipe. And when you do that, that's giving a bearing surface for your hose clamps. This is where the hose clamps are really going to shine. You can save a lot of money by using hose clamps and not bolt clamps. But the hose clamps don't clamp as tight. And so if you can give them a little lift that they can hold on to, you can use them all day long. It's going to want to cool onto this, and then this is going to be really hard to get out. So you're going to want to just kind of time it to where it's starting to cool down. This is really starting to get tight, and then you pull it out. And you want it to cool with this round surface in there for as long as possible so it doesn't get all deformed. 
but of course you're going to need to be able to get this out. Method two is my absolute favorite. Stay with me now, this happens very quickly. You are going to put your pipe directly into the oven and this is gonna be at a lower temperature, about 300 to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe three to five, five to seven minutes until the pipe is able to do this. Look at how squishy that is. Right now, it's a little bit too squishy. So you're actually going to wait until it is firmed up a little bit so you can kind of mold it a little bit more and it'll hold its shape. But you can use this opportunity to get yourself set up. The first thing you're gonna need is this reducer we talked about, this is gonna keep the ends circular. You can already see that this one is not circular. You know, it's if it cools like that, that could be a problem. So you're gonna stake this pipe and you're just gonna shove it in there. Notice once it gets thick right at the edge here, you'll get that just past the lip there. The next thing is one of your hose clamps or a bolt clamp. You're gonna to wanna to use this right off the bat to start making your flange. The first one you'll be able to do while the pipe is hot like this. The second one you might need a heat gun to heat up that edge so you can do it down there later. Or if you buy duplicates of these parts, you might be able to do it all in one run. Your bolt clamp is going to go right where you want your hose or bolt clamps to go when it's all installed. Doing this with a drill is a good idea and the reason being you're going to want to move quickly. And you can see it's starting to flare out just a little bit. It's really nice and tight. And this is now really, really stiff. Remember what I said, you have to move fast. So I'm going to use my knee here. And it's possible I spent too much time explaining this to you. It really does suck, but this is the prime time for doing this because it'll keep its shape when you're done. Woohoo! I waited too long on that one, but you can see that I've started to create this bend. This is the method where the ripples are okay because we're going to use this method for some of the bends that are really, really difficult to do and are exceeding the limits of the PVC pipe. Right here, you are going to need kinks. And the reason why you're going to need kinks is because this is so ridiculously close to where the intercooler is that you're going to have to make a bend that your PVC pipe is not capable of doing. You're going to have ripples, but you want to massage it and minimize those ripples as much as possible because every one of those is a fluid flow loss. The other thing you can do is you can maintain your cross-sectional area by taking it from a circle, making a bit more of an oval as you make that bend. So this one, you'll notice it starts to flatten out. Once your pipe has cooled down to where it's not going to change shape anymore, you're going to then want to cut off the excess. Some of these ends will get a little flared out from being in the oven. Can you see here, you see how we've got a nice lip right there? So when we go and we clamp down on that, it's gonna have a good surface to hold on to. A pair of pliers is your friend in this next part. And if you've really jammed it in there, possibly even a little bit more heat from a heat gun to get this guy out of there. And look at that end, it's very nice and round, but you can also tell that it's quite a bit larger than the larger diameter of your reducer here. This is two inches and this is larger than two inches. So two inches fits in pretty nice and snug. And the larger one actually does fit in right on the end. And that's great because that is all gonna be a nice bearing surface for your clamps. As long as this is a larger diameter, it's gonna give you a lot more chance at getting good grip on this. And even now where it still feels warm, this is a very, very solid pipe and it's right back to the original rigidity, except now it's a new shape. As you just saw, this pipe went from being really, really flexible to completely solid in about two minutes. Somewhere right before it's too hard for you to bend is right where you want to be as far as bending the pipe. So you've got maybe 15 to 30 seconds to get it into shape. With that said, it could take you a couple tries, not a big deal, just go and put it back in the oven and start again. The other thing is you can do smaller tweaks. You can take a heat gun to certain cross sections and tweak those individually as needed. It's gonna take trial and error. I have a note here, you know, $52, but with scrap, you're gonna end up with 60. Make sure to buy enough PVC pipes, that way you can have some scrap pieces, because you're gonna screw it up. 
at least once. At least I hope you will, because I screwed it up a lot. Jesus. Next, let's talk about that Y pipe just a little bit more. There's two modifications you need to make to this. One is this goofy little thing that I got off of Volkswagen in the junkyard. I pulled this off of a turbocharged Volkswagen Jetta. If you look in here, there's a mesh and these little flaps act as a one-way valve. This is so perfect for the pipe going to the carbon catch can because I'm finding that it shoves carbon, leaks carbon everywhere. And I don't want carbon getting into this nonsense. So this is going to keep the carbon at bay while also acting as a check valve. I do still have my carbon catch can. I believe that it's a useful tool and we should probably keep it in the Jeep for now. And it does help with emissions, I suppose. But the carbon catch can, since I'm getting rid of my air box, it vented into the air box. I need somewhere for it to go. This little doohickey is going to do that for me. Not a lot of help for you because uh, I have no idea what it's called or what the Jetta was or where it was. But I pulled it off in the junkyard and it happens to be perfect. It's even the right size nipple. Little two-part epoxy and now we're on our way. Woohoo! Inlet air temperature sensors right there. The other thing we're going to put up here, you'll see the dotted line because it's actually going to be underneath, is your air inlet temperature sensor. Rolling it back, there is another video where I talk about the air inlet temperature sensor in depth. There will be a link up uh, in the corner and down below and wherever. Go watch this video. The air inlet temperature sensor is in the factory location located on your intake manifold. And although it that's great, that's probably the most accurate air temperature you can get right before it goes in the cylinder. The intake manifold is right above the exhaust manifold and it is prone to heat soak and that heat soak then gets into your sensor. So it's going to start leaning out the engine uh, after a while of driving, especially on a hot day, you'll notice that you'll get off the highway and suddenly your Jeep is just way slower than it used to be earlier that morning. That's because you're getting some heat soak that is then going into your intake manifold and it is take, causing your sensor to read a little bit warmer than I believe is correct. So what we did in that video is we moved the sensor to the air box and by doing so, it's completely divorced from the rest of the system and all of the heat associated with it, meaning that it's going to read correct ambient outdoor temperature. However, it's going to read slightly colder than what is actually going into the cylinder, which will cause the computer to add more fuel. So yes, you will run a little bit more rich in this scenario, which just so happens to be a huge advantage when you're running a supercharger because you have more air, you're gonna eventually need more fuel. And so by doing this, you are going to be helping yourself out just a little bit. So I do recommend that modification and I do recommend that video. Anyway, all of that is to say that the air inlet temperature sensor we're gonna put into this Y pipe because that seems like the best place to put it. And you can drill a hole through here. You can either shove it in there and epoxy it, or I actually ran a tap and I tapped the hole and you can screw it right in. If you want to know more about the drilling and the tapping of a plastic piece in the air inlet temperature sensor video, I do exactly that. The next step in the process is to paint the PVC pipe. And there is something that I learned the hard way. We're gonna learn from our mistakes today. Painting the pipes looks really cool. Don't paint the interfaces that go to the rubber. You can kind of see that, see how it's like sticky and slimy? Yep, the paint turned into a liquid for some reason. I don't know if it's the heat, I don't know if it's the rubber or what's going on here but it turned into a liquid and acted as a lubricant. And all, a lot of these pipes popped out under boost and uh, didn't work so well after that. So now we know. So if I was to do it all again, I would mask off the ends of the PVC pipe and then I would paint it. Painting is great. PVC pipe is susceptible to UV light. UV light can make it brittle. I read this online. I don't actually know, but that's what they say. Also, painting PVC pipe makes it look like it's not PVC pipe. And those who want to say that your Jeep supercharger kit is lame because you use PVC pipe, 
won't know it's PVC pipe, so they won't tell you that it's lame. Anyway, paint the PVC pipe whatever color you want, whatever looks cool, because it looks cool and looking cool is half the battle. Also, after you've painted it so it looks cool, you've masked off the ends of the pipe prior to painting it so that way it doesn't slide right out of the rubber boots, you can apply stickers like I did. I have two stickers. I have the Bust, B-E-W-S-T, Boost sticker, and that one I created myself. I, I completely made that in Photoshop, and we cut it out and put it on there, meaning if you absolutely must have it, I will put it for sale on JeepSheepTVStore.com. That's again, that's JeepSheepTVStore.com, and you can buy one of those if you really, really want that sticker. The other one, the compressor sticker that I also made, but it's an image that I pulled off of a Mercedes and it has the Mercedes logo, which I definitely cannot sell you that. That I think that should make sense. I can't sell Mercedes logos and stuff. So what you can do is you can go on to JeepSheepTVStore.com and you can buy a Jeep Sheep TV sticker. You can specify that you would like an additional compressor sticker thrown in the box for free and you can get it that way. <laughs> what are a couple of the things that went wrong in this process? Well, in here, between the supercharger bypass outlet and the piping, there's your adapter, and it is prone to letting loose. Then there's the Fernco adapter, which goes from the piping to the bypass valve, which is also prone to letting loose. And the reason for that is this whole system here is wanting to jiggle free. And so it's not just this being a high pressure area, but this whole system is trying to separate. As the engine is receiving boost and whatnot, everything is kind of moving and pipes are flexing, and this is gonna want to separate. There's two things you can do for that. One being to get some bolt clamps and use bolt clamps in this area to really hold the system together. The other one being I developed a little spacer that separates the top PVC portion from the bottom and that kept them from wiggling around. That was pretty important. It just keeps the pipe from rattling all about. I took a PVC pipe, I cut a couple notches out of it, I put some felt tape on here, and then I uh, drilled a hole. You can just run some zip ties through it and hold it all together. Now it all moves as one unit and it's just going to reduce vibration a little bit. You can also take another little piece and create something that pushes up against the brake booster so that your pipe is supported cross car and that it's not going to move around. That piece looks like this. So I took a two inch PVC pipe and I just took a saw and started cutting out little notches and areas so that way I could slide this to fit right between the two components and it's sitting on the diameter. You can see it fits like that. On, of the pipe right here, and it's pushing on my brake booster. And so that's going to keep it from moving uh, cross car. Also, it's important to make sure you're flanging your PVC pipe, especially in those high pressure areas. And again, that's done by using this little reducer here. And it's not easy, but it is worth it. The last thing you're gonna want to take into account is where there might be a lot of heat in your engine bay. For example, right in this area where your exhaust manifold exists, a lot of that heat is going to be radiating upwards, and especially if you're moving at slow speeds. So I installed a heat shield in that area to keep the PVC pipe from getting overly hot, and I did a lot of strenuous off-road driving, and the PVC pipe was it maintained great temperature. So either the heat shield worked or I didn't need it at all, but you can see how I installed the heat shield. So right here, and I've got a header, which doesn't help, the header's right there and it sends heat straight up into my pipe. This area right here is significantly hotter than most of the engine bay. So what I made, this is a piece of aluminum. It's just sheet from Menards. I cut it, I wrapped it around just a scrap pipe, and then you cut in about an inch or however you want to do it, and you fold it with pliers. Just so you have these little feet. Now this is going to go on the bottom here, and I'm just going to take a couple zip ties, go around it, and it's going to hold this little guy on, and that is going to dissipate the heat, it'll block the heat from reaching my pipes, just in this area. See? It's just about the size of that hole. And there it is installed, 
Real simple. But it should work. Going forward, before we start the next video, there is a few things that you're going to want to buy first. The first one, and both of these are going to have links below, so don't worry. The first one is an AFR gauge, what that is air fuel ratio. That's going to show you what air fuel ratio you have. And I would suggest getting this early before you've even put on the supercharger or started using it so you can understand what normal parameters for your Jeep are. Does it run kind of rich? Does it run, run kind of lean? What is it actually doing and when is it doing it? So that when you put the supercharger on, you understand the characteristics of the Jeep prior to doing something new. The second one is on along the same lines. You want to understand your Jeep, so you're going to get yourself a vacuum gauge or a boost gauge. I guess a boost would be more important because it's going to be capable of handling positive pressures. Not all gauges show positive pressure. Boost gauges will. And I found the cheapest one possible, which has actually worked very well for me. And of course, I have that link. What you're going to want to do with the boost gauge is just look at it while you're driving so again you can understand what the normal parameters for your jeep are am i at negative 12 psi well maybe i am because i'm at elevation what is it when i'm at full throttle is it zero is it negative one do i have restrictions these are all questions that you're going to want to ask so you can understand the effects of the supercharger when the supercharger is installed that number should become positive. And that's pretty exciting, especially if you've been looking at negative numbers for weeks prior to installing the supercharger. Thank you so much for watching these videos and thank you for commenting on the community tab saying that you are joining me in this process. And again, that is a little terrifying that you're willing to do something uh, that I'm telling you to do, but I'm really glad that you trust me enough to follow along. If you're not subscribed for some crazy reason, make sure that you subscribe. If you're walking into this video and you're really confused, there's other videos before it, so check that out in this series. Also, it's important to note that I am a part of Gone Jeepin. We have a podcast, which is really cool, and we go to events, which is also really cool. We're going to be going to Fall Color Tour here really soon, which is an annual event and it's really exciting if you like old Jeeps. So make sure to go over to Gone Jeepin. There's obviously a link and you can subscribe to them and you'll see me over there as well. Another channel that I'm involved in and I am participating with and I'm really excited about is Unofficial Use Only. Uh, Greg at Unofficial Use Only, he has built some of the coolest SEMA build Jeeps that I've been following for years. Him and I became friends through Gone Jeepin and he has a channel of his own which I'm doing some editing for. So go over to unofficial use only and hit subscribe for him. That channel is about to get really exciting as he does a lot of really cool stuff. As always, thanks again for watching and I will see you in the next video where we will finally be talking about fuel management and how we're going to get the engine to respond and work well with the supercharger.